using machine learning. So uh, beside my name, you can also see three other names uh, on the slide. Uh, so Petra Genus and uh, Sasha, sorry, Sasha Strum come from the Department of Nanostructured Materials and uh, myself and Professor Sasha Jeroski, whom you've already had the chance to meet, come from the Department of Knowledge Technologies. Uh, so we live in times where we see the um, increased electrification of, of society, which uh, in turn uh, increases the energy consumption. So this uh, imposes a new request upon us to um, find the more, uh, to transfer to more greener um, energy sources. And uh, um, it is upon us as scientists and conscious human beings above all to, um, to respond to that request. Uh, so, um, fusion power is one of the ways to go uh, in that direction, and uh, it uh, also has some obstacles that need to be overpassed uh, if we want to ever like implement it in the in practice. One of the greatest challenge uh, challenges is to find materials that are suitable to withstand high thermal um, high thermal loads and to without uh, having any significant uh, uh, changes in their thermomechanical properties. So the diverter is uh, one of the uh, most essential parts of the fusion reactor. It is situated at the bottom of the vacuum vessel and it's in charge of extracting the heat and the ash that is produced by the, uh, by the fusion. Uh, it also protects from pl plasma contamination and uh, ensures that the walls around the, the reactor are protected from the high temperatures and neutron bombardment. Uh, so that being said, we can conclude that there are quite some requirements for, the, uh, for choosing the right diverter materials. Uh, it needs to have high melting points. It, it needs to have low activation, good mechanical properties at operating conditions, high thermal conductivity and high thermal shock resistance. So by now I've said thermal like 10 times, which uh, leads us to a suggestion that we need to choose a material that has a very high melting point. And tungsten is uh, kind of natural choice because it's the metal with the highest melting point. Um, and this has been uh, also uh, proven in uh, scientific uh, research and, and development uh, um, efforts. Uh, but it also comes with, uh, with some drawbacks. Uh, tungsten, when, when it reaches 1000 degrees Celsius, it, uh, it uh, recrystallizes. Uh, so we need to find a solution to this. And one of the ways to do it is to do particle reinforcement uh, with uh, including um, oxide and carbide particles into the, um, into the matrix of uh, tungsten. Another way to do this is to uh, actually uh, include tungsten composites uh, with tungsten carbide uh, and uh, this is uh, a way to, to uh, get this tungsten carbide particles is by using the carbide precursor uh, synthesis. Uh, so when we use this uh, as starting mixture, we use the sintering process uh, by uh, fast field uh, uh, assisted sintering, also known as SPS, which is spark plasma sintering. And we get some consolidation, uh, consolidation pellets. The consolidation pellets are then characterized uh, in, the, in terms of density, phase composition, microstructure, thermomechanical properties, and so on. Uh, so the subject of the research at the Institute, uh, what the nanomaterials uh, department does is uh, starting the mixture with the tungsten and tungsten, uh, tungsten carbide, which is the latter uh, of the two things that I suggested in the previous slide. Uh, and it uh, uses them uh, to consolidate with FAST. Uh, it sinters, uh, it uh, makes the, the pellets uh, and it uh, also includes some of the, uh, the variables uh, like sintering temperature and time and the uniaxial pressure that is applied. Uh, the output of the sintering is then the consolidated pellets, uh, which you can see on the third um, image. And uh, on the fourth image, uh, you can see the uh, micro uh, structural, you actually can't see it, I'm sorry. Uh, you can see the structure of di tungsten carbide grains, uh, which are formed in the tungsten uh, boundaries. So these are some experimental results from the department. Uh, on the 
leftmost uh, graph, we can see that at the x axis, we have the percentage of the carbon, and at the um, y axis, we have the uh, concentration of uh, the tungsten carbide. Uh, the red dots indicate the experimental results that we had, uh, and the uh, uh, yellow dotted line uh, actually shows the calculated. Uh, uh, the calculated um, oh, yeah. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. We get the calculated uh, calculations by uh, chemical formulas. So we can see that uh, the experimental results yielded the uh, the results that that we have uh, lower tungsten. Uh, concentrations that uh, then we would uh, expect with the calculations. Uh, the uh, composites, uh, the composition of the, of the subjects also in, um, um, affects some of the mechanical properties like the flexural strength, which is the bending strength and the uh, hardness of the, of the material. So this is actually the data set that we get at the end. Uh, the, um, we will come back to it uh, later. I mean, how we used it in the in the machine learning part, and the um, green uh, green part uh, is actually what we have uh, as uh, uh, parameters. So the mixture. So we have the applied pressure. We have the height, the density, uh, the diameter. I'm sorry, and the mass of the of the uh, tungsten and the tungsten carbonate. Um, and uh, then we have the sintering uh, properties that I uh, mentioned uh, some slides before. And at the end, we have the characterizations in blue of the pellets that we get at the end. So the number of samples that were prepared during this research uh, is close to 750. So where does uh, machine learning step in this problem? Uh, we can, to put it most simply, we can look at it as a tool to predict the starting composition, uh, to help the, the department um, in constructing the, start, the starting compositions to get a specific result at the end, uh, a specific result at the end. For example, if they want to achieve a higher bending power, or if, if they want to achieve uh, higher percentages of density, uh, this in turn reduces the number of experiments and it saves time and it saves resources for uh, the department and everyone else. So what we did was uh, implement regression trees uh, and uh, ensembles of regression trees in the form of a random forest. Uh, and we did it for a single target prediction and multiple target prediction. Um, and we also did some feature ranking with random forest. Okay, uh, so coming back to the data set, we have independent variables and uh, dependent variables or targets. Uh, as a standard uh, supervis supervision task, we are using the independent variables to, uh, to predict the targets or the dependent variables. Uh, in this case, as independent variables, we have the percentage of added carbon, we have the applied pressure, the dimensions of the sample, height, diameter, and mass, and we have the sintering related measures that I already talked about. As targets, we have the percentage of theoretical density and uh, the flexural or bending uh, strength of the uh, palette at the end. So first we did single target prediction, which means that uh, we did separate models for two of the, for the two targets uh, separately. Uh, so on the left side, we can see the prediction for the fluctuating or bending strength uh, expressed in megapascals. We can see that the carbon percentage was the most important feature here. Uh, if we have a higher, um, a percentage uh, higher than 50%, uh, for the carbon, uh, then the sigma or the bending strength uh, is the average of the sigma or the bending strength is uh, 1,258 megapascals. Uh, megapascals. Uh, when predicting the percentage of the theoretical density, the diameter played the, played the pivotal role. Uh, when the diameter is bigger than, uh, than 10.9 millimeters, the um, percentage of the theoretical density is close to 95%. When it's between 9.95 uh, millimeters and 10.9 millimeters, uh, the percentage is close to 40%. Uh, percent, and then when it's below 9.95 millimeters, the percentage is close to 70%. Uh, the second thing we did was multi-target prediction because we have two targets now. I believe the professor talked about it yesterday. Um, so here I won't go into depth uh, in the tree. I mean, we can see that the minimum, the maximum sintering, sintering temp temperature and the mass 
and also the carbon percentage play the, uh, the biggest roles here. And uh, in the notes, we can see that we have predictions for the averages for both targets. Uh, these were constructed using PCTs, so not uh, regular regression trees, but predictive clustering trees. Um, I believe, again, that the professor talked about it yesterday, but um, to refresh your memory, it's essentially considering the decision to use the regression tree as a hierarchical uh, clustering system. So at the uh, beginning on the top node, you have the entire data set. And then as you go down, you recursively get smaller and smaller clusters. And at the end, you get the uh, smallest uh, clusters when you reach the stopping criteria. Uh, it was done using one global model for both targets. Uh, and for building the multi-target regression trees, the class uh, uh, software was used. Uh, if you want to play around with it, uh, the link to the software is in the presentation. Um, PCTs are implemented in class plus, and also uh, we can do ensembles and uh, regular single trees. Um, the ensemble model was also developed for multi-target prediction and also for the single target prediction. Uh, ensembles are essentially a set of, of base, of base uh, classifiers uh, that uh, all vote to predict uh, a single or multiple targets. So next we get to the feature ranking, and this was done using the random forest score. So how the random forest score works is essentially it takes uh, one uh, feature and it, cal uh, it calculates its predictive power or the error it makes when it predicts the target. And then it uh, permutes it in a way uh, that it uh, adds some noise to the, to the uh, attribute. Uh, so then uh, we measure the predictive power on the permuted uh, attribute, and if the um, predictive power decreases uh, significantly, that means that the um, that uh, attribute has more predictive power and it's, uh, it's supposed to be ranked higher in the, uh, in the entire structure. Uh, so this is the, the formula that we use. Epsilon is the number of trees. The first error is the error that we get on the permuted uh, attribute and the uh, second error or error uh, out of back uh, for the uh, tree is the error that we get with the original uh, feature. These are the feature rankings uh, for all uh, three models. So the first two represent the single target models uh, for the feature ranking for uh, bending strength, feature ranking for the percentage of, uh, of density. And then the third, um, the third part uh, represents the feature ranking for the multi-target prediction. Uh, if you remember when I showed the trees for the feature ranking of bending strength, the carbon percentage was the only one uh, there, which means that it's the most important. Uh, the feature ranking for the percentage of uh, density uh, also had the diameter as the uh, most important uh, feature, and the feature ranking for, multi for, for multi-target prediction, if we go back, you can see that uh, the maximum, maximum sintering temperature and the mass were uh, one of the highest uh, features. So in conclusion, uh, the results from the machine learning shows, uh, show us that the processing parameters has the strongest influence on the samples um, mechanical properties. Uh, the diameter of the pallet uh, has the biggest influence on the relative density and uh, for the flexural, uh, for the um, bending strength, the carbon percentage was the most important one, which separated data into two clear groups. Thank you, and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Cynthia. Very interesting talk. How about any questions? Okay. Here we go. I think Kevin, you have the mic. Thanks for the talk. In the previous slide, you, sh you show fish rankings where the carbon percentage is the first uh, on the left hand side and the third one at the central mm -hmm. in the central panel. Why does it become the second and not the first uh, when you do the multi target prediction? Can you explain? Uh, yeah, because this was done uh, for the, a single target. So we are looking how carbon percentage is affecting the prediction of the bending strength and then the prediction of the uh, density. 
So it's for, uh, we measure the error on different targets. So it, it is expected to have uh, different um, okay. rankings. Hey, uh, thank you for the very nice talk. So how, uh, presumably you're an expert on, uh, on these three methods. So how easy was it for you to take the code that you had and, and apply it to this data set? Did you have to adjust it somehow or did it work pretty straightforwardly out of the box? Yeah, well, by using the class uh, software, it is pretty st straightforward because uh, it's already, everything is already generated. You just need to play around with the, um, with the attributes. Because it implements the predictive clustering trees, you just need to list the descriptive part uh, and the target part and the clustering part. So you said it was pretty straightforward. Yes. Okay. Very good. Any other questions? Good, then I can ask one. Uh, I wanted also to know something related to the software and use of software. So this was a regression problem, right? Yeah. So um, what kind of quality metric did you use? Um, the Pearson cor correlation coefficient. Okay. And uh, what were the accuracies that you yeah. achieved? Maybe I missed this in the talk. Yeah. So for the bending strength and for the percentage of uh, the density, we got somewhere around uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 on the training on the test data. So on the training data, it was even higher. And for the multi-target prediction, we got uh, somewhere uh, around 0 0.7 on the testing data. Okay. So what would be, uh, I mean, is this enough accuracy for the experimentalists? And, and what, how would you go about improving the accuracy? Well, yeah, that's kind of a touchy subject. I mean, uh, what's what's accurate for? Uh, oh, what's enough? Yeah, what's enough? Exactly. I mean, especially in the in the correlation coefficient part. Uh, but uh, as I said, the main task uh, here, I mean, the main reason why we were doing machine learning is was to help them kind of understand uh, which uh, of the how to set up the initial experiment. So how to set up the mixture, which of the um, which of the attributes, like for example, they need to pay attention, now they know that, that they need to pay attention uh, more maybe to the uh, diameter uh, when predicting, uh, when uh, predicting higher percentages of, uh, of the um, density. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you to all our speakers of the session again. And now we have a coffee break uh, just outside and we'll be back in 20 minutes. So it's a bit of a short coffee break and uh, we start at 22.04.